With Kroger brand products from Bakers, you can make all your favorite things this holiday season. Because Kroger brand's proven quality products come at exceptionally low prices. And with a money-back quality guarantee, every dish is sure to be a favorite. These are a few of my favorite things. Whether you shop delivery, pickup, or in-store, Kroger brand has all your favorite things. Bakers, fresh for everyone. There's never been a better time to find out why BetMGM is the king of sportsbooks. Download the BetMGM app and place a $10 money line wager on any NBA playoff game. If either team hits a three-pointer in the game, you'll win $200 in free bets, regardless of your wager's outcome. Just use code LIBERTY200 when you make your first bet. Sign up now and discover BetMGM's daily promotions, boosted odds specials, and more. Download the app or go to BetMGM.com and use code LIBERTY200 to win $200 if either team hits a three in any NBA playoff game. Visit betmgm.com for terms and conditions. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. Pennsylvania only. New customer offer. All promotions are subject to qualification and eligibility requirements. Rewards issued as non-withdrawable free bets or site credit. Free bets expire seven days from issuance. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, help is available. Call 1-800-GAMBLER in partnership with Hollywood Casino Morgantown. Hey, it's Christine from Storyworthy. Today on the show, comedian Dana Gould shares two stories that are stranger than fiction. So as another comedian that I knew uh, said, uh, I'll give you a ride. So I said, great. So we're, we're driving to the show. He runs a red light, gets pulled over. The cop gets out of his car. He takes an envelope of cocaine off the dashboard and puts it behind his belt loop. And then says, uh, Dana, there's a giant bag of pot at your feet. You might want to hide it. I had no experience with drugs or being in this situation. So I did the dumbest thing I could have possibly done. I took the bag and I shoved it up my pant leg. Today on the show, comedian Dana Gould shares two stories that are stranger than fiction. Stay close. Hi, this is Dana Gould. When I'm not washing my hands and staying six feet away from everything, I'm listening to Storyworthy. And so should you. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Quarantined in Los Angeles, California. And whether you're a longtime fan of the show or a new listener, welcome to Storyworthy. Storyworthy. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed the show last week with director Barry Sonnenfeld. Boy, oh boy, is that an interesting guy. Dana, have you met Barry? No, I've never met him, but I'm a, a huge fan of his work. In fact, uh, weird, you know, uh, six degrees of separation. Uh, the Men in Black movies were written by uh, my college buddy, Ed Solomon. So it's a small world. That's unbelievable. I mean, that's like... Um yeah, that it does get to be a small world when you just think about like show business people. And you, wait, where'd you go to college again? Well, I went to UMass. Ed went, uh, I think Ed went to Harvard, but we we knew each other when we were in yeah. college. Yeah, but there's like so many people that went to Emerson, and there's a lot of very common universities that people share out here. Yes, indeed, there's a lot of uh, Massachusetts transplants. A lot of Massachusetts transplants. It's true. Anyway, uh, you you should go back, Dana, and listen to Barry Sonnenfeld because we talked about so many interesting things, including uh, he lives in Telluride, Colorado. Must be nice. Yeah, and in that town, they were able to test every single resident for COVID-19. Really? Yeah, the whole town. And the whole town is negative and they're just living a normal life now? Or are they still on social distancing? No, Well, they're still social distancing. But yeah, it's true. 2,300 people live in Telluride and they all got tested. Wow. Yeah, it was interesting. So we talked about that. And then we talked about um, him filming the movie Misery and how screwed up that was because there was no snow. <laughs> And so they had to keep bringing in this snow to make a lot of those shots. Oh, so I didn't know. There's never snow when you need it and a lot when you don't. Yeah, exactly. And then Barry's real story was about him. (laughs) I'm laughing. It's not funny. Well, it was funny. He was in an airplane crash at the Van Nuys airport. 
and you know he's okay, but it was very serious. And uh, yeah, I know a couple of people that were in airline crashes. Yeah, it's- Bob Goldthwaite uh, was in a airplane, and the the wing, the one of the engines blew up, and uh, you know they landed safely on you know they uh, you know immediately you know immediately landed. Pilot had control of the plane, but Bob said. Uh, you know, when I'm in a situation like that, when I'm in really rough turbulence or whatever, I always look at the stewardesses, the flight attendants. Yeah. And you, if they look calm, then I know there's nothing to worry about. And he said the flight attendants were looking out the window and crying. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> that, that is super funny. That is super funny. Well, actually, in my solo show, of course, we're all so... Right. <laughs> It's so Los Angeles in my solo show. No, but I, I was I was a flight attendant for seven years. Seven years. And I, oh, I didn't know. That. Yeah, I was, and I talk about having that exact same emergency situation when uh, an engine blows out, and we did land safely. But it's a it's it's a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so go back, you guys, listen to Barry Sonnenfeld, but not today, because today I'm here with the fantastic and amazingly talented comedian and writer and creator of a couple of great shows, Dana Gould. And uh, Dana's been on the show before talking about <laughs> talking about how he met Piggy Demon, who is a, a well, I guess you would say like a, a goth. Oh, well, no, I, I met... Uh, Piggy Demon, who is Rob Zombie's bassist, through my friendship with Myla Nurmi, who was Vampira, who was the inspiration for Elvira. That's right. You have such an extensive uh, wealth of knowledge when it comes to horror films. Yes. Yeah. I'm the only person in that chain without black hair. <laughs> but you specifically know a lot about uh, horror movies from the 70s, I would say. Yeah, from the from the from the you know, the thirties up to the seventies and early eighties, that was, uh, as my friend described it, that was my football. That was the stuff that I really, uh, uh, galvanized my, uh, mentality as a kid and my, uh, sort of imagination. And oddly I wanted to, from a very early age, I wanted to be an actor, but I wanted to be an actor in horror movies. Like I didn't care about like having a great script or being a movie star, I wanted to be. I wanted to be in horror movies. I wanted to live in that world, and my. Th- and then I got into comedy because I was funny, and my theory was that I would. This is true that I would become so famous as a comedian and a movie star that I could then write my own movies. And then I could put myself in them. So that was my way of, <laughs> this way I'll end up in horror movies. It, it's sort of like the most back ass where it's way of becoming a writer you can possibly. Yeah. It's like, I want to be a pastry chef. And if I'm elected to the United States Senate, they'll have to let me bake anything I want. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like- <laughs> Yeah, but the exciting thing about that dream is that it really came true when you created Stand Against Evil. Yes, it's true. It took me a long time, but it did actually work. And I did have that thought. I did like, well, I'll be danged. It worked. It took a while. There were a lot of uh there were a lot of wanderers off the path, but uh yeah, it ended up working. But what a thrill to be able to do that for three seasons and work with such amazing a- other actors. Yeah, it was it was it was uh, terrific. I, I I would like to say it was uh, the highlight of my career, but I I would like to think that that's ahead of me. But it was certainly a highlight of my career. It's one of those things, and it it's one of those things, and it it speaks to what I was going to talk about today in the story. Uh, it's something that I have to remind myself actually really happened. Yeah, I'm anxious to hear your story. Uh, Dana brings forth the topic Stranger Than Fiction. And uh, I'll tell you what Stranger Than Fiction is what's going on right now. (laughs) No, it's true. In her country, because if you would have written, and you knew you're a writer, Dana, if even if you wrote this on one of your Simpsons episodes or something, you know, wrote something about a pandemic, it would be like nobody would believe it. I mean, I know, I know there were the movies like Contagion and stuff like that. Well, the movie Contagion now is just the news with Matt Damon. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, it, 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 
it, it quite literally is the news. I mean, and, and you know, the run on uh, the mythical fake drug for Scythia that they think has saved them is the run on hydrochloroquine and, or whatever, however you pronounce that thing, and, uh, uh, um, which is not a fake drug. It has applications for people that really need it, but it just doesn't cure this. Well, you know, I had aquariums for a long time, and I just remember having that stuff, and I think, no fucking way would I put that in my body. What are you talking about? You know? <laughs> my, yeah, no, I know. We prob- uh, my daughter has five fish tanks, so we probably have some here in the house. Oh, really? Well, you have three daughters. Are they all with you? Uh, no. Well, right now they're, uh, this is, they're, some are at their mom's house and some are at my house, but, uh, but everybody's, uh, uh, healthy. So we, we shuttle back and forth. That's what I do with, um, my daughter's, my daughter's father as well. We're all quarantining, quarantining, but it's kind of quarantining between my place and his place. Yeah. It's very, uh, and we will, we live very, very close. And yeah, so uh, do we, we live like a block away. Oh great. Yeah. Same thing. So you know how it works really well. Yeah. It's really helpful. In fact, my daughter for the first time walked to his place the other day. Uh, she'd never done that on her own. She's 13. No, I, yeah. I actually walked to the end of the block and then <laughs> her dad walked to the end of his block and then I like waved my jacket over my head, you know. When sure, I sure. No, I know. I, yeah. And then when he gets there, he waves his jacket. <laughs> and then, and that might seem crazy to people who are listening, but, you know, you got to be safe out here in LA. Now, you know, I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts and in the 70s. And, you know, we'd, I'd walk to school. I'd walk home. I'd just get on my bike and I'd go riding around. We, you know, on, on on Halloween, me and 11 of my friends would end up in a three towns over at two in the morning. You know, it was just, it was, we were completely un, you know, it was just, it was a different world. I know, and, I know. Um, and, uh, and now, house. yeah, now my daughter was, my, my, uh, 16 year old, was so like, hey, I'm going to take a walk. And I was like, take your phone with you. You know, yeah. so just going around the block. We have to do that stuff. You and I actually, um, I think we talked about it on our last conversation, but we do have a lot in common. We're both one of six children. You're the fifth. I'm the sixth. Wow. And then you we got both, a lot of attention. Yeah. And then we both grew up Catholic. And then we both wrote for The Simpsons. Oh, wait, I didn't write for The Simpsons. <laughs> Oh, that, that wasn't me. I, that was a dream I had. The day is young, Christine. The day is young. Um, but uh, really, though, um, my mom would, well, she didn't even open the door. The door was just open, and we'd leave after breakfast, and then she'd ring a cowbell, literally a cowbell, ding, 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 which meant lunch was ready. Then we'd go home. Where, where did you grow up? Where did you grow up? In the, in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, but really not even the suburbs. It was really very rural, it was actually rural because there were no like lampposts, no sidewalks, you know? Okay, yeah. It was actually, same thing to where I grew up. And I had a, we had a dog uh, when I was a kid uh, named Coco that was a, a German short haired pointer. They look, uh, you know, just like a brown dog. And, uh, and he just lived, he'd live in the town. Like I'd be riding my bike and I'd just see my dog. Like, you know, I go to the, there are these things called the park and the pond. You know, you'd go to the, where is everybody? Well, they're at the park. If they're not at the park, they're at the pond. And, and, and you'd ride your bike around and you'd just be like, say, oh, there's my dog. Just kind of hanging out with people. And then yeah. he'd come home later. And <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, no, we had a cat that used to go, just go visit our neighbor, just go into their house. And that was that, you know? Uh, yeah. So it's interesting, actually, when I think about my old neighborhood and I talk to my folks now and uh, my family about what's going on, you know, they're all quarantining and everything, but I don't think that they feel the the same um, pressure that we do in terms of we're in a, a city and there's just so many people. Because I think to myself, like, my mom only interacted with three people a week to begin with. Yeah, it, you know, it's it's true. And... You know, my, you know, a lot of our older parents just watch Fox News all day. So they are living in a different reality than we are. And I don't mean that to be funny. It's quite literally true. Mm-hmm. They, they get a completely contrary information source. And, uh, and, um, you know, it, it's just kind of like sliding through a window. Like, how you doing? You know, because I, Lord knows what they're being told today. So how are you killing time, by the way? 
Honestly, I am not, I'm so I have so many things that I'm doing uh in addition to uh, I've assigned to myself an activity every day on my uh on all my feeds I post a, what's called a pandemic minute. And uh it's just a minute long comedy bit uh, opinion piece. Uh they're all funny uh and um I post one a day. They're on all of uh, hashtag pandemic minute on Instagram or Twitter or whatever. Oh, great. Now, wait, are they they're short videos? Yeah, one minute videos. Oh, I can't wait. I, I can't believe I didn't know this. So hashtag pandemic. Pandemic minute. Pandemic minute. That's so smart. And it's but it's good. Like I'm, you know, as soon as I'm done here, I'll record it and post it. And I have my podcast and I'm working on a couple of writing projects. So I'm actually uh, the, the minute we're done here, I have to finish work on a a, a forward to a, a book that somebody is uh, that I'm writing, and uh, that, uh, and then I have to get into uh, a couple of uh, other projects that I'm writing. So I'm actually and with that and three kids. Uh, I'm I'm bl- blessed in that I'm very busy. Yeah. What's the uh, book? Uh, it oddly uh, it's I didn't write the book. Uh, it is the uh, the biography of my friend Myla Nermi. Oh wow! Uh, that is that is coming out, and uh, I'm writing the uh, the afterword for it. Oh, that is so great. That's really great. So on the book cover, it'll say "Afterword" by Dana Gould. Maybe. <laughs> I know it's going to be in there. Well, you knew her. You were with, her. you know, you spent time with her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she was, a, she was a, she was a, a good pal. She wouldn't. She, I'm like, wondering what she would have thought of all this. I know. I think about like what my dad would have thought. I think about what a lot of people would have thought. I mean, what? It's just unprecedented, and uh, I'm glad we're in California because it seems like we might have a bit more of a grip on it in terms of. Well, we have a governor that believes in math. Yeah. I love watching Gavin Newsom. First of all, best hair of any governor. Yes. He has, I, uh, he's not politically aligned, but, uh, but him and Mitt Romney have a, have a hair game that is unmatched. It really is. And then I also like watching Andrew Cuomo. Um, I just believe him. Well, any adult, any functional adult is fun to watch. And, and again, it's one of those things, you know, thematically consistent, uh, uh, you have to remind yourself that it's real, uh, you know. And, and and I was trying to describe if you watch the the you know the news and you see the president, it's like I, I feel like I'm on a double decker bus on a narrow mountain road that's three inches from the side of a cliff, and it's being driven by a chimp who's on fire. Uh, you know, there's there's no. And it, and everyone's just like, yeah, well, you know, the chimp's the driver. We do what the chimp does. You know? <laughs> it's so true. And it just drives me crazy when people say, well, I think he's doing the best job he can under the circumstances. I mean, you know, what do you want him to do? It's like, well, we wanted him to tell us what was happening in December. Yeah. Well, they're right. He's doing the best job he can. But that doesn't say much about what he's capable of doing. Uh, you know, that that's... That's why. I, that's how I came. That's how I came to be at peace with my parents. I, uh, you know, they did the best they could. Yeah. Doesn't speak volumes about their abilities, but they did the best they could. We all, we're all still alive. <laughs> well, it's true. And during the times that we lived, because again, we're pretty much the same age in the seventies. Fathers didn't take part in the kids' lives, at least in my world, at all. And nobody asked me anything. Nobody, nobody asked me, how's your homework? Or, like, nobody no, asked no, me God, anything. No, 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 my father was astounded that I uh, changed my uh, daughter's diaper when we were visiting and she was a baby. Yeah. He couldn't believe that I, that I changed the diaper. Isn't that Isn't something? And now I change his. <laughs> Aww. Hey, are your folks both alive? Yeah, they are. Uh, I'm very uh, lucky. My dad's 89, and he's completely, you know, could put you through a uh, wall. Still, he's uh, he he. As I say this on in my act, so I'm not slipping bits into a conversation, but uh, it's a it's true. I I watched Gran Torino with my dad, which was like watching King Kong with a gorilla, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and my mom, my mom lives in a, a nursing facility. She's uh, she's not uh, at her full capacity. 
I see. I see. Now, is your dad, is your dad being safe and quarantined? I think. You know, I, I he lives in a very rural part in the middle of in middle of Massachusetts. Uh, like, so who's shopping for him? He does. He does the shopping. Uh, no, he drives every day. Uh, you know, he goes down to my brother's once a week. My oldest brother lives right next to him, next door. So he has food, and and, uh, and I go uh, like when you when you go to the store, do you do you uh, wear gloves? No. <laughs> 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 but uh, but he washes his hands. He comes home. He washes just, his hands. And- it's just the funniest damn thing when you see these people like still going to churches, and it's just it just boggles the mind. Uh, you know, you have to say. You know, my father was raised in uh, was born in the Depression, lived through World War II, uh, fought in Korea, and uh, you know he's lived through 1968 with you know every political leader getting shot and murdered. Um, a lot of those people think like, yeah, I've, I've seen this movie before. I, I've lived through the end of the world four times now. You know, it, it, it's funny. I was talking to people that were really heartbroken yesterday that uh, that Bernie Sanders dropped out of the presidential race. And uh, and and I was, you know, uh, yeah, you don't don't look to politics for a hero, you know, and, and I like. I've seen this movie before, you know. I remember being really excited about Michael Dukakis. You know, it's like it's, it's, this. This I've seen. This movie happens every. Yeah. How about in two thousand? How about the Al Gore thing? Yeah, this movie happens all the time. No, and no, a politician certainly certainly vote and and vote for the people that are going to do the best job. And I'm incredibly politically active, but but they're not going to save you. Yeah. For sure. That's just something that comes with be- having been around long enough to see the cycle go through a couple times. Yeah, my brother says that same thing. And then he also says, honey, 50 years, it won't matter. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. But I believe that in 50 years, this country will be restored to what it once was, a barren wasteland ruled by reptiles. <laughs> All right, listen, we're going to get your story in just a second, but I did want to remind everybody to follow me on social media at StoryWorthy. And then, of course, check out StoryWorthyPodcast.com and join my mailing list. Oh, that would be fun. Oh, yes. And then, of course, as you know, Story Smash is on hold because everything is closed. So, Dana, you still haven't been a judge on Story Smash. You have to do that. Yes, Yes and yes. Yes, I've not been a judge yes. on it. Yes, I need to do it. It is super, super funny. We've done 34 shows in a row at the Improv. God, I know. Over. We're going to have our three-year anniversary coming up. And then this month, of course, was the first month that we haven't been able to have it. So we'll be back soon enough, and uh, you'll have to judge on it. Because I will. it's so damn funny. It really is. I will. And I love, I love, uh, and I love the improv and I love all those people down there. Yeah, me too. Me too. It's like a family. And I've actually been a little worried about them because I think about the waitresses and the bartenders and like, what are they doing? Everybody, you know, everybody. And I, you know, I know people from, you know, I know that uh, swingers just went under and the pikey just went under and all those people are looking for jobs. And I know executives at Disney that are getting laid off and furloughed and 40% pay cuts. And uh, no, this is, this is going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is, we're, li- we're living a chapter of a history book. No kidding. No kidding. Um, you know what's always strange to me to think that is closed is Disneyland and Universal. Yeah. They lose twenty five million a day with that park closed. Wow! I hope that they're doing like some big cleaning, or maybe they're making use of the time. You know what I mean? Like, are they upgrading? I hope they're cleaning, but I hope that they're wearing. I hope that it's the characters in hazmat suits. Like it's still the walk around. Boy, oh boy, there's a lot of dirt here. Uh, you know, I think that. Uh, how, wait. Here's what I want to ask you. What's going on with your daughters? Because as teenagers, they're losing dances and proms and all that, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Well, I have a 17 and a 16-year-old. And from what I hear coming out of their bedrooms, they're planning some form of uh, violent overthrow of the government. But uh, I don't stick my nose into their business too much. Uh, And uh, I have uh, my youngest just turned 11. And, uh, you know, she still likes me. (laughs) 
Is she? Yeah, my daughter too. Is she homeschooling? I'm not not homeschooling, but she's doing like yeah. They're all well. They're all in spring break right now, but they're all online. Yeah, yeah. my daughter as well, like a Google Classroom thing. Right every day. Yeah. Yeah every day, uh, but I don't know. I fear that. I fear that there it's it's going to set them behind a bit because there's no way you can learn, especially to me, the math that you're supposed to learn. No, there's no there's no uh, substitute. So we'll have to see what happens. Yeah, and it's very difficult for my oldest daughter, who was supposed to go to her colleges this summer because she's a junior, uh, and you know that's that's off. But you know it will. Everybody is going through the same thing. I know. So. I was just wondering because I know your 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 uh, age ch- children are different than mine. But uh, anyway, all right, you guys, let's get right to Dana's uh, story. As you know, Dana Gould, he is a comedian and a writer and a voiceover artist and the creator of Stand Against Evil, which we just talked about. It aired for three seasons on IFC, and then you also, of course, worked on The Simpsons for seven years. Um, and I heard you talk about The Simpsons before. Obviously, you were so lucky to work on that show, and obviously, you learned so much. And like, there's a thousand million good things about working on it. But you also said, I heard, uh, that if you still worked on The Simpsons, you would be overweight and depressed. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Why is that? Uh, I th- I think that um, you know I I probably don't have the creative discipline of that. I I I'm too. Uh, f- frenetic in my ideas, like I, I, I want to do too many different things at the same time, and uh, just working in one, uh, you know, working in 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 the very narrow, you know, as as wonderful it is in that narrow world, writing stories for these ten characters uh, for for seven years w- was enough for me. I there was too many other things that I I wanted to do and. You know, if there's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll touch. I touch on this a little bit in my story. You know, um, one of the reasons that I'm probably not as famous as other people think I should be is because I do too many different things. That I also. You know, I don't just act or I don't just write or I don't just have a podcast and I don't just tour as a comedian. I do all of those things because I enjoy doing all of those things and I like to uh, – I have a very uh, healthy level of interest in different things. So uh, uh, it's it's not the only thing I do and I don't – you know, uh, uh, maybe if I just concentrated on one element and did only that all day – uh, I would be in the long run better, uh, better served. But uh, and and this actually this actually factors into the story I was going to tell. Um, Stephen King wrote in uh, a great book about for any creative person. Stephen King wrote a book called On Writing, which is uh, amazing, and it is one of my favorite uh, quotes in there, which is that um, uh, your life is not a uh, your, your life is not a support system for your art. Your your art is a support system for your life, and it's not a you know. And and um, to that end, I'm very happy with all of my decisions because I'm uh, my life's pretty pretty good. Yeah, your life is pretty good. No kidding. But also, look at this office. I mean, come on, <laughs> it's stunning. Uh, no, but you know, if you uh, did just stay on the one path you would be denying yourself all those other talents that you have and that you share. And the only thing I'd have to show for it is millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, right. But 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 I will think I'm just thinking in my head like also like um I would think that the Simpsons writing room is full of very bright people, Incredible. of course. Yeah, they're the best. They're the best. The best. I mean, they're from Harvard, but also <laughs> they're the they're the best and there are also some people from Harvard. Yes. yes, but <laughs> they're but, not but, all I, but I think about Conan O'Brien, for instance. Yeah, because he was both. Yes, there's a lot of great. Yeah, but again, here you have a performer. So how are you going to tie down a performer to a writer's room? Yeah, it's, it's hard. I yeah, I was, and when I started working there, I was already well established as a performer. You know, I I'd been on, I'd had albums and specials and. 
I was, uh, you know, I was an actor. I was known. I was kind of, you know, uh, uh, I had a, and uh, I'd been on Letterman. I'd, I'd been a guest on Letterman and, then, you know, and all those things. Yeah. And then I became a writer. Yeah. And I had to really subsume my ego uh, yeah. to do that because where I thought I was hot stuff, you know, they looked at me as like, oh, we hired a guy who works at the carnival. Interesting. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. But, but, but also because it's like, since you're not dealing with real people, the extent to which you can go in terms of your ideas can go anywhere with The Simpsons because the characters can go anywhere. Within limits. <laughs> really? Are there limits? Uh, yeah. I, well, I mean, if it works in the story, yeah. But, it, uh, you know, there are, there are the reason that show works so well is that the rules are very firmly in place. I see. Well, you were very fortunate to take a tour through Springfield, as it were. Yes, I was. I, no, I learned how to be a writer there. I mean, what a great place to really learn. You know, I, 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 every day I would get to watch you know, some of the best writers in yeah, the wor world work. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was great. And, and, you know, you, you write episodes, but everybody contributes to everything. And it also gets you out of your ego. And oh, yeah, man, you got to check your ego at the door because I bet they'll slam you down. I, I wrote an episode called Papa's Got a Brand New Badge where Homer starts like an ADT, like a, a home security service right. called Spring Shield. And the funniest joke in the show is not only not mine, I don't know who wrote it. And I keep asking, who wrote that joke? And no one knows. Like, I think it was Tom Gamble, but I'm not sure. Like, I don't know who wrote that. What's the joke? It's, it's a really bizarre joke where they're doing a commercial for Spring Shield and there's an old woman in bed and this... Maurice Sendak looking monster walks into her bedroom and goes monster and the woman screams and then Homer comes out and goes you know spring shield will protect you and he gives the monster his card and the card takes the monster takes the card and says monster put in wallet and he puts the <laughs> card in his wallet and I was like wait is this a commercial did this happen in real life and the monster has a wa and monster put in wallet one of my favorite things and I don't I I can't honestly tell you who, who wrote it. Those were three wonderful words in a row. Four words. I wrote a uh, yeah. My big uh, yeah. My I think my big claim to fame is I wrote a joke that became a meme. So I guess that's something. I guess that is definitely something. Do you remember what it was? Oh uh, yeah, it's a uh, old man yells at cloud. It's uh, Grandpa <laughs> Simpson. It's a news story. <laughs> that's a classic. That's a classic. That's me. That's a classic. I know. I'm very proud of that. You should be. <laughs> and then you also, of course, have your podcast, the Dana Gould Comedy Hour. And again, this goes back to you having um, many talents and your hand in many different things. And that affords you to now be able to do your podcast where a lot of other people are stuck doing nothing. Yeah. Well, the great thing about the podcast is it, it keeps my name there and it keeps my, um, uh, uh, the, the, for lack of a better for term fan base uh plugged in and uh and you know again it forces me to work uh you know i i, I stay involved i stay engaged and it allows me to do stand up because when you go on the road now you know you can still do the tonight show you can do um uh late night but those shows don't really put people into seats in a comedy club the way they used to uh, now it's it's podcasts. Uh, it really is one. You know, it's a hundred percent. I you know I've done every late night show. Uh, I pretty much um, I've done every you know everything. And and you know what I get when I meet people after shows is I love your podcast or I love you on Adam Carolla's podcast. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Well, I love that so much because what it does is it puts the power of the, um, you know, it puts the control in the creator's hands. It's a DIY. It's very, it's very punk. Yeah. Well, you're my, I think you're number 616 episode of Storyworthy. There you go. So, yeah. So it's like, you can't take my RSS feed. All my favorite bands are punk bands 
And it's the mentality behind that. I don't, you know, I'm not gonna have a record label tell me what to do. There you go. I love that. All right, you guys can find Dana over there on his Twitter page at Dana Gould. Uh, do you do the Instagram? You do do Instagram, yeah? I do everything. It's uh, Dana Gould, D-A-N-A-G-O-U-L-D. It's perfect. All right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for Dana Gould. Well, as I was telling uh, Christine, I uh, grew up in Massachusetts and I grew up uh, in the middle of the state in a very sort of wooded, uh, uh, quasi-rural area. And uh, I'm the fifth of six and my uh, I have four older brothers and my dad. And it's a very rough, tumble, blue collar environment. Everybody drank a lot. Uh, everybody hunted. I, I grew up in a house full of rifles, uh, hunting rifles. Uh, everybody in the house had camo <laughs> clothing. Well, uh, did you go hunting as a child? I was just gonna, yeah, I was just gonna say, except me. <laughs> I was the uh, I was the white sheep of the family. I uh, I I um, and for whatever reason, and I and uh, I decided to define my personality by doing the opposite of what everybody else did. So where everybody else in my uh, family, um, you know, just kind of got by in school but didn't really put anything into it, I really excelled. Uh, All my brothers uh, drank and smoked pot and partied, and I did none of that. Um, They were really into sports and uh, hunting, and I was really into comedy and horror movies. Uh, and I just went in the opposite direction. And uh, 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 my friend Bob Goldthwaite is, grew up in a very similar circumstance in, in upstate New York, which is the same as central Massachusetts in terms of uh, what, you look, what it looks like. And uh, both Bob and I were thought to be gay by our parents because we did not want to go hunting. Uh, so... It, it, and it's just again a different. It was a different era. It was the 1970s. It was a different era. But that's the uh, that's the uh, sort of environment that I grew up in. And then when uh, I was actually my, you know, one night in high school, you know, all my friends drank because that's what you do when you grow up in nowhere. That's you know, it, you that's it. you go out in the woods, and it would be you know six degrees outside. And we would go out into the woods and they would drink. Uh, And I would like, I would have a beer just because I was there. But uh, what were they drinking? Because we would drink malt duck. uh, We would drink uh, Molson Golden Ale was the uh, was the uh, the champagne of uh, suburban Massachusetts. And because it was from Canada and it was imported. Yeah. And, 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 and it was just, and I, you know, didn't really like the taste. Uh, I've only, uh, do, I got drunk one time in seventh grade and I got sick and I was done with that. Uh, haven't been drunk since. Uh, and, uh, it was just a, an extreme reaction to, uh, a pretty common upbringing. Um, but, uh, I never, uh, so uh, yeah, one night my friends and I, uh, were out uh, and they were, we were in the, we were in the park of the park and the pond and, uh, we were drinking and, you know, I was nursing a beer, so I fit in and, uh, we got busted by the cops and, uh, you know, the cop that busted us was a friend of my dad's and everybody's parents came to pick us up, uh, except mine. Uh, he just waited until everybody's parents had come and gotten them. And then he drove me home and told me that, uh, cop cars have square headlights. So the next time you see square headlights coming, screw. And, uh, and I was, and when I told my mom, like what had happened, I said, and the thing is I wasn't even drinking. She said, well, don't tell your dad you weren't drinking. He thinks it's a great story. Um, and that's just the environment that I grew up in. So then I went to UMass uh, to go to college where everyone was drinking all the time, <laughs> you know, and, and my, uh, I had, I had one friend, uh, also named Dana, oddly enough. Uh, and we would make fun of the people that we were going to school with because just their whole life, we were just like, bees, 
Like that, they would just wake up in the morning. <laughs> Bees! I couldn't. Uh, it just never. It's a, it's a chip in my brain that I don't have. I just never understood the the desire. Uh, and, uh, by that time I had already started doing, uh, comedy. I was, uh, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian and, and I was working at the, at school. I was hosting like a, an open mic at the campus bar and I was doing shows around the area. Like I was already making Wait. money. Wait, you had already started stand-up? I started stand-up two weeks after high school. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I was, uh, I had started to do stand-up. I'd started to do open mics before I started college. Um, Wow, what was your material? Do you remember? Well, it was as insightful and brilliant as any 17-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> no, but was it about high school girls? No, it was just, I, was, I had one funny joke. I had, I had one funny joke, which was, uh, uh, when you go to church, they can turn water into wine, but that doesn't work at the beach. Hey, no drink, uh, no, no, when you go to church, I'm sorry, I said it, I'm sorry, it's been 35 years. Uh, when you go to church, they turn wine into the blood of Christ, but that doesn't work at the beach. You can't say, hey, put that away. I'm sorry, officer, the blood of Christ. What about the two six packs? I'd like you to meet the 12 apostles. That was the joke. <laughs> uh, you know, funny joke, professional. It's pretty funny. Professional. Uh, and... Uh, so yeah, I went to UMass and the first thing I did, you know, I, I got my, got my books, I got my classes, I got my dorm room. And then I went, uh, to the campus bar and said, Hey, I'm a comedian. I want to host an open mic. And so I had an open mic show every Wednesday night. That's Um, fantastic. And some, and I have friends that still out here from those days, Dave Rath, who's a big comedy manager. I, uh, Andy Gordon, who's a a comedy writer. I, I knew them both from those, from that time. That's, That's great. great. Um, but uh, so I wasn't into partying at all. My my college wor- memories are not of parties and going berserk. It was just basically kind of doing classes and really becoming a comedian and, and thinking about stand-up all the time and, and driving out or taking the bus out to do shows. And then I moved uh, to Boston to do um, to do open mics. I got a, you know I was done with school. I got a crappy day job um, with uh, with Tom Kenny, who's now the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants. So, yeah, Tom and I were open micers together, and uh, we worked at a, a computer company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, running errands and getting lunch, um, and. Uh, and doing stand up and again now now comedy at that point uh, I worked a ton because it was the early it was the mid eighties and comedy was stand up comedy was ubiquitous and all over Massachusetts every town had a comedy night at a bar or a local and and so there was so much work to do here 's how I worked all the time i didn 't drink. I didn't do drugs, and I had a car. So I would always be, well, you're doing a show in Saugus. Well, put Dana on. He can drive. You know he's going to get you there and get you back, and you don't have to offer him any of your cocaine because he doesn't want it. Because the the drug scene in Boston comedy in the mid '80s was like being on the Eagles tour bus in the late '70s. Like I saw more, I, I saw Mount Everest of cocaine every night. Um, uh, everybody drunk and and just blasted, and I uh, and Tom, <laughs> to, you know, just weren't into it, yeah. wasn't interested. Uh, and because I wasn't interested, I uh, worked all the time. Yeah. Now, this is something that happened to me one night in Boston that to this day, when I think of the story, I, I flinch because I, I can't believe it really happened. Uh, it was a, 1985, And I was doing a show in Cambridge, and I had to get to um, 
Alston to do another show. You know, that's what it was like. You'd do a show in Cambridge and then you'd go over and do another show in Boston. So as another comedian that I knew uh, said, uh, I'll give you a ride. So I said, great. So we're, we're driving to the show. He runs a red light, gets pulled over. As he's getting, as he's, the cop gets out of his car, he takes an envelope of cocaine off the dashboard and puts it behind his belt loop and then says, uh, Dana, there's a giant bag of pot at your feet. You might want to hide it. I had no experience with drugs or being in this situation. So I did the dumbest thing I could have possibly done. I took the bag and I shoved it up my pant leg. Oh, so no. now it's mine. <laughs> the cop walks right up to my window and says, uh, you know, step out of the car. What's that you put in your pant leg? Oh. Have you ever been arrested before? Uh, and now I've never smoked pot, never bought pot, never owned pot to this day. Uh, at that point, I was, it was an out of body experience. I was watching myself, at, you know, and, and my oldest, and, and I was, I, I, I don't know, uh, to this day, I don't know what would have happened. The other comedian, uh, saw what was going on and, and, and to his credit said, that's mine. Uh, and, uh, the cop, uh, took the marijuana, walked to his car, got in and drove away. Wow. And to this day, I don't believe that really happened, <laughs> but it did. It does seem like I'm an atheist, but it does seem like that was the hand of God coming down and going, yeah, I don't think you can handle this. <laughs> yeah. How old, how old was the cop? Was he a young, young guy? Young guy, you know, sure. I, I think I know what happened. I don't think it ended up in the evidence locker. No, I don't think so either. That's why I was thinking maybe he was just like, that's how he got his weed too. Oh, yeah, no, here's to corruption. Uh, you know, and my, you know, uh, it was t to this day. I Yeah, that's very strange. That, that doesn't happen because that's not the way the job goes. That's what I mean. Uh, it, it, it shouldn't have happened. And... Mm. No, you got really, really lucky. You got really lucky. I mean, I've gotten in trouble for things and thought to myself, like, if you would just, like, even if you get pulled over or something, you know, you think to yourself, like, if you would just turn away, turn around and walk away, we'll just forget about this whole goddamn thing. And then he did. That's amazing. I, 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 I have to remind myself on a regular basis that that didn't really happen. That is stranger than fiction. All right, let me hear the other story. Well, the other story goes to the uh, the Stephen King quote about your your life not being a uh, support system for your art, but your art being a support system for your life. And this is another story that I have to remind myself uh, really happened. So after my uh, my time in in the, in the trenches in in Boston in the in the mid eighties, um, I uh, moved to San Francisco for a couple of years, and then I ended up in Los Angeles in um, nineteen eighty nine nineteen ninety. Uh, and around the early, you know, from 1990 to 1994, five, I was one of the hot young comics in the country. I, you know, I had a lot of, I was, you know, I, that was my sort of period of, you know, you know, I did a bunch of television pilots to try to, you know, Seinfeld was on. So I did, you know, Dana and, you know, I, I had, uh. I had the, uh, as I like to say, I, I had my hand in more pilots than an Air Force proctologist. Um, <laughs> you did a lot of pilots. I did, yeah, I did uh, Dana. I did Nice Try. I did uh, World on a String. I, did, I had a whole bunch of pilots. And uh, they're all posted. They're all, you can see them all on my uh, uh, podcast Patreon page if you. Are there any uh, projects, are there any pilots that you did that you're not proud of? Oh yeah, <laughs> sure. 
But some that are, but the, some that I, some that I'm, some that were so good, I'm angry. I'm some that are so good, I'm still angry about. Yeah. Uh, I wrote a pilot in uh, two thousand and maybe eight or earlier uh, called The Last Larry, which was basically um, the way I described it at the time was it was the cast of Seinfeld in the world of The Walking Dead. Uh, But The Walking Dead wasn't a show yet, so I said Dawn of the Dead. It was basically the movie Zombieland, but before the movie Zombieland uh, as a show. And uh, and it predated The Walking Dead. Uh, And uh, Comedy Central at the time said, uh, comedy and horror, you can't mix them. They don't work. And, that's uh, crazy. That's crazy. Oh, I know, and that's why I I don't have it. Um, uh, but that's what enraged uh, that. It still, ma- if I think about it, it still makes me angry because, hey guys, you were wrong. Uh, and uh, but the, the uh, stand against evil, the show that I eventually did, was just my way of doing that show because I couldn't do the last Larry. I just kind of redesigned it into a different format. But uh, yeah, but they were uh, they were they. That's the one that still gets my goat. And, and, and I wouldn't do it because I think that zombies, have, that's been done. You know, why do something that's been done? And people still come up with crazy, crazy zombie comedies. And I'm like, isn't it? No, no, I agree. I mean, I think comedy and horror have a lot in common. Well, they're, they're cousins. Laughing and screaming do the same thing. They're involuntary reflexes that release tension. Um, and when you do a, a horror movie... Um, I wrote a horror movie that's, uh, uh, that will be on uh, Sci-Fi Channel probably this December. Um, and uh, right now it's called Deadly Presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the bits are called gags. You know, you, you go into a, a comedy movie, you get 25 gags. You go into a horror movie, you get 25 gags. Uh, the comedy movies there to make you laugh, the horror movies there to make you jump and scream. Uh, you know, it's the same, it's the same thing. It's just, it was just one of those things where, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't say this often and I'm not staunch about a lot of things, but in this particular instance, I was right. They were wrong and That's it right. still bothers me. <laughs> I, I don't blame you. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. My life. I, I can't complain, which is the, which is, which goes to this story. Um, so in the midst of, you know, going on Letterman and doing comedy albums and going on, you know, late night talk shows all the time and and being kind of, you know, famous in my area of expertise, Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the great white whale of, of, of that is getting on Saturday Night Live. And, uh, uh, they had seen me. Uh, and uh, I knew that they, they knew who I was. I knew that they, I don't know what they thought about me. They said they liked me, which means that they've seen me. Cause what are they going to say? No, we don't like you. Of course. They, yeah, they like you. Um, uh, but, uh, I, I knew that they knew who I was. So, uh, one year in the, in the early nineties, um, I was, uh, going to audition for the show again, uh, with two other comics, um, and they were going to uh, fly us out to Chicago and we were going to perform for Lorne and the, the casting people. And I had just met uh, my, uh, my, and my life had finally really, at that point, really settled into a nice groove. I had a, a, my favorite apartment <laughs> that I've ever had uh, on Beechwood Avenue. Uh, and I just started dating my girlfriend who I would, who I would uh, later marry. And divorce, and I, uh, you know, th- things were really good, and I was, you know, I was king shit of Turd Mountain. Uh, so they, so they fly us out to uh, Chicago, and we perform. And uh, I went up first, and false modesty aside, I obliterated the room. Uh, you know, you just have those nights where everything works. And, uh, and everything clicks and the crowd is with you and you just, you know, the, doing stand up in a show is a lot like surfing, you know, and if you catch, catch a wave, yeah. you ride it. And even if you're a great surfer, if the wave is gone, you got nothing to ride. 
uh, in terms of the energy of the crowd. And I went on first, and, and that was the wave of the day. And then the other uh, comedian went on and did kind of okay, but it was clearly the event of the night had happened. Yeah. And then the other uh, comedian went on, and he didn't even try. He just kind of effed around. And then uh, the three of us went out after, and uh, and I'm thinking to myself, uh, I just got Saturday Night Live. Uh, and I literally remember thinking the phrase, so this is what it's like when your dream comes true. Wow. And what I did not know at the time, but I, they've since told me, was the other two comedians were also thinking, he just got Saturday Night Live. So the next day, we fly back to L.A., and we're in the airplane in the three-seat row, and we're sitting yeah. together. And I'm looking at these other guys, and in my mind, I'm going, am I going to have to sell my apartment? I really, I'm not thinking about what I should be thinking about. I'm not thinking about how I'm going to work, you know, what, am I, what kind of position I'm going to occupy in the cast. Do they want me as a writer or a performer? I don't, you know, I'm immediately going to, do I need to buy boxes? Do I move my apartment? Do I keep my apartment? What about my car? What about my girlfriend? How's that going to, what's going to happen with my girlfriend? I'm going to move to New York. I can't break up. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And in the meantime, while I'm thinking all these thoughts, I'm looking at these other two comedians and I'm thinking, Adam Sandler, Chris Rock, you'll get your moment. This one's mine. Just sit back and don't get burned by the, by the fire coming out of my rocket. <laughs> and Adam and Chris got the show and I did not. But I... Uh, I look back on that and I just think, thank God. Thank God. Because I, my relationship would not have survived that. And I wouldn't have gotten married and I wouldn't have my children. And my career probably would have gone in a very different direction. And I might not, you know, and, and all I can say is that everything that I have today that makes my life great, I probably wouldn't have. I might have other things that make my life great, but I can't complain about anything. Um, so uh, long story, uh, that girlfriend and I uh, get married. She later becomes a, a big executive. Uh, you know, we're married and she's a big TV executive, still is, uh, a quite, quite brilliant uh, person. And uh, she goes to New York. This is years later. Now, now I'm on... You know, I'm on The Simpsons now. We're married. We've got kids. We've got a big house. You know, we're 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 char- you know we're 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 hitting hitting all the bases. She goes to New York to do a uh, to see Chris Rock in a play, and she comes back from New York and she says, "You know that story that you tell about auditioning for Saturday Night Live?" And I go, "Yeah." She goes, "It's true." And I go. I go, what do you, what do you mean? What do you mean it's true? She goes, I was just talking to Chris Rock. He told me the same story. I'm like, but I'm like, of course it's true. Like, do you think I've been lying at dinner for 10 years? <laughs> but, but again, to, to what Stephen King said, uh, you know, how can, I, uh, how can I complain? Yeah, listen, that's an incredible story. That's an incredible it's story. True. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I don't think I've ever heard anything like that. So it was you were really with Chris Rock and Adam Sandler. Yeah, yeah. And Chris uh, tells the same story on um, on uh, WTH. I mean, WTF. WTH. Yeah, on WTF. I can't even say the letter F. I'm that decent. Um, so. Um, who did the lackadaisical set, Adam or Chris? Uh, no, Chris. Chris went up there and 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 you know did what he does. I mean, they're both brilliant comedians, 
but it was in the wash of just this crazy set. Um, and uh, it was, you know, had he gone on first, he would have had the set that I had. And I would have been in his position. It had nothing to do with the material. It was just the audience. And Adam totally fucked around. But, but they knew, because I've since gone to the show. I have friends on the show. I've talked to Lauren Michael. You know, what they knew that, that I didn't realize is that what they saw was, oh, he's finished. Like, that I knew who I was, and I was kind of polished. And they were more the raw material because it's not about the performer, it's about the show. Yeah. And what they saw was these two guys we can fit into the show. This guy is is going to be harder because he's too solid already. And I don't mean solid like as a person or anything. I'm not giving myself any... Uh, it's just in terms of where I was as a comedian, uh, what they did was actually quite smart. Right. Obviously. No, I totally understand, but it's hard to not take it personally in that moment, obviously. Oh, no, you take it very personally <laughs> in the moment, in the moment, mm-hmm. yeah. But I'm just wondering, in Adam's set, did he just disregard his material and he just stayed with the room? I don't know if he had any material, to be honest with you, but I yeah. He, but he was Adam. I mean, it was brilliant because he realized, or he didn't realize and just lucked into it. Like, you know, he was all personality and that's what makes stars. Yeah, that's the Q factor or something. Yeah, well, you know... It, Eddie Murphy is a personality, and he becomes a movie star. Uh, George Carlin is a comedian, and it's all about the material. So, like, it, it's hard to envision George Carlin as a movie star because he's really just a writer that says what he's written into a microphone. Uh, someone like Eddie Murphy, who's a, a genius and a brilliant comedian, but... but uh, well, he's a, he's a brilliant comedic actor. Um, but people don't put on Eddie Murphy's albums the way they put on George Carlin's albums if you grew up with them. And, right. you know, it's a, the, the, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't read a book of Eddie Murphy's transcribed stand-up. I would read a book of George Carlin's. Um, but Eddie Murphy, you put him on screen and you can't take your eyes off him because he's all personality. And I'm not yeah. shit-talking Eddie Murphy. I'm a... No, no, no. I'm just trying to think of an analogy. I'm trying to think of another analogy, you know, like, um, uh, what about Robin Williams? I mean, such an amazing stand up and also an amazing actor. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. You can do being, being a great comedian doesn't automatically mean you're a great actor. Right. You know, Bill Hicks was a great comedian. He was not a great actor. Lenny Bruce yeah. was a great comedian. He was not a great actor. I don't think I ever saw Carlin act. Did he act? Yeah, he's he had been, he was in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. He was in Outrageous Fortune. He was did a lot of TV spots, but he was he was a better comedian than he was an actor. Yeah, you know, you, you yeah. sometimes when. But the reason is because it was you know you look at you know Richard Pryor was able to bring what he did on stage to a role. Eddie Murphy is able to bring what he does on stage to a role. I I, I think it's harder for people like George Carlin and Bill Hicks who are just. You know, writers that said what they wrote into a microphone, uh, and I, and I would put myself in that category, not with their talent, but in terms of the way I do stand up. It's more of a, a, a wordsmith. Yeah, well, I'm I'm more of a less personality, more content, and uh, um, uh, so it's, uh, it's it's you don't always you don't always make that jump. Yeah, you know, no. and and Adam and Adam, uh, uh, whether he knew it or not. Uh, nailed it. Yeah. Um, do you know if people ever get a second shot at auditioning for Saturday Night Live? Not you, but anybody. But anybody. I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, the, the next, a couple years later, it was, uh, I was almost in it again. And oh, you're kidding. Is it the same people? Same, same. It was different, it was different uh, that year. I think that year it was down to me and Jim Brewer. Uh, and uh, pr- the story I heard could be completely fake. But was uh, it was down to me and him and uh, uh, and, and and Jim got it. But again, I, I don't have sour grapes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know because, like you said, I mean, you know. Uh, and by the way, for the record, Jim Brewer, great guy. Yeah, I, I <laughs> bet know? he is. <laughs> yeah, Jim's a great guy. But part of what happened in your story is that you got in your mind. You were younger. 
you got in your mind, you got caught up and you were on to the next thing and the next thing. And so you're thinking about, I got to sell my apartment. I got to move to New York. So you're way, way, way ahead of what's going on. I remember one time, um, (laughs) I had this show called ready for the weekend movie on USA network. It was like doing interstitials. And when I first got the job, I started worrying about firing a manager because I wouldn't want a manager after a while because I would want I wouldn't want to pay that 15%. So I I started worrying about firing a manager and I didn't even have a manager. Yeah. It's like True. what are you talking about? But I do I I don't do that as much anymore, especially now that I have a child and now I'm more in the moment. But my head would start spinning out of control like I'd be 20 steps ahead and it's like I have anxiety about something that's not even going to happen. Yeah. No, I I get you. Uh, you know, the, the thing also, when I, when I look back on that, is uh, having <laughs> been in a lot of therapy, what, what I was really looking at when I, was, when I was thinking about on the plane in terms of do I buy boxes, what do I do with my car, is confronting a, a titanic loss of control yeah. over my life which was frightening. And so I was immediately going to, what about this can I control? My books. Do I store them or box them? Uh, You know, it was all about, uh, it was all about control. Trying to compartmentalize what you thought that was coming. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I, uh, as I say, like, you know, that happened and thank God, because... You know, I look around at my life now and uh, I wouldn't uh, change anything. I know. I know. It, it's it's really crazy that things happen for a reason and all that stuff. It's just very hard to, you know, have faith that it's going to be okay in the moment. And then when you look back, you realize, oh, I see how that all stitched together. That was my life. I see. That led me to that and that and that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly. Oh, oh, I get it now. You see what's going on here, Dana, is we're getting older <laughs> and the youth. And what do they say? What's wasted on the young? Youth is wasted on the young, yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, man, I am so happy you could come over and tell some stories today. No, you didn't come over. We're quarantined, of course. Yeah, I was so glad to walk in the other room and tell stories. <laughs> because those were two really great stories. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. I didn't see the end of them coming at all, either of them. That was just great. So thank you <laughs> no, so there, much. No, there are two stories that really happened that I have to remind myself really happened. Yeah, because those are both really far out. Yeah, those are far out. They really are. Uh, you guys, make sure you check out um, Dana over there on Twitter. Let him know that you enjoyed his story at Dana Gould. And, of course, follow me over there as well at StoryWorthy. And don't forget to check out StoryWorthyPodcast.com and join my mailing list. I would really appreciate that. And you guys, really, stay safe out there. Please socially distance yourself from one another. Uh, you know, all that stuff. I just want people to be safe, you know? Keep calm and wash your hands. That's what I'm saying. You know, the British used to say during the Blitz, keep calm and carry on. We just say, keep calm and carry Purell. All right, you guys, one more time. On behalf of the very talented Dana Gould, thank you so much, friend. Really, thank you. Thanks, Christine. Great to see you again. I will do Stories Mag. Good. Oh, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. All right, you guys, my name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story-worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Sure, we have 30 seconds to tell you that drivers who switch to Progressive could save big. But then what? Well, there is a nice piece of stock music playing behind me that a talented composer worked really hard on. So let's enjoy it. Wow. 
almost overshadows the saving big when you switch to Progressive Parts. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Can I be real for a second? That goal you have to exercise and eat better, you really can do it. But nobody is going to do it for you. And nobody has to, because you can do it, if you have the right tools, and a community that cares about helping you get results. And that's us, Beachbody. It's as convenient as your TV or laptop, but you need to decide that you're worth it. Let us help you succeed. Here's how. Go to Beachbody.com to claim your free membership and start feeling great. With Kroger brand products from Bakers, you can make all your favorite things this holiday season. Because Kroger brand's proven quality products come at exceptionally low prices. And with a money-back quality guarantee, every dish is sure to be a favorite. These are a few of my favorite things. Whether you shop delivery, pickup, or in-store, Kroger brand has all your favorite things. Bakers, fresh for everyone. 